Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Today we're going to fix a radio receiver together. The story goes like this. The person that had this radio receiver tried to do a restoration on it, and it never worked again. So usually this goes one of two ways. Usually it's really, really bad when you open it up and parts and pieces are hanging everywhere, or it's a really good restoration and something minor went wrong. At any rate, we're going to find this out together. So let's discover what went wrong in this radio and bring it back to life again. Let's get started. Here's the radio that we are going to get working today. Very simple little radio, RCA Victor. And everything feels good. The needle moves and it turns on and off. At least the switch clicks anyways. I haven't plugged it in at this time. On the back side, it's got a screw here and a screw here. They're both different. Hopefully they're not threaded into a cracked Bakelite case inside. So usually they put a schematic or diagram on the bottom, and as you can see, that's long since gone. And really, it looks like the only thing that's holding this thing together is these two screws right here and the knobs on the front. So what I'll do is I will pull these off. They come off just that easy. And I'll have to get two different screwdrivers here for the rear side. Let's see. This one will work for this one down here. Look at that. You can see that kind of a star washer on that. I'm glad that didn't tear this up. There's a little piece of it missing on the end. Maybe it did. And let's see. This should work for this one here. All right. And if all goes well, hopefully we are in. So I'll put this down like this. And that way if it wants to come out, it's nice and easy to get everything off, just like so. So I'll put this behind my chair very carefully. Speaker is in very nice condition. Look at that speaker. Looks brand new. This radio looks like it's in very nice condition. I can see why he wanted to restore this. Look at this thing. Almost looks like it came out of the box. Well, already I see a problem. I already see a problem here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reposition the camera here and we'll take a look at this problem that I see. I'll give you a quick view of this right here. And you can guess at the problem if you don't already see it. And I'll reposition the camera and I'll be right back. The first thing I noticed when I removed this radio from the case is the vacuum tube placement. So I'll start over here with this variable capacitor. So when I move the tuning around, as you can see, the needle moves and the capacitor moves at the same time because they're all attached by a dial string, which doesn't feel all that incredibly smooth, but it works. At any rate, what happens here is there's two sections in this capacitor. So this tunes the antenna, which is on the back here. You can see this wire that's on the back side. And this portion of the capacitor tunes the oscillator. So what's happening here is this is known as ganged. So these two capacitors are ganged together by one shaft. And the reason that they are ganged together is so that they track. Now, what all this means is, is when you're moving the dial on the radio receiver, what's happening is, is there's a frequency change because this capacitor is adjusting the oscillator all the time. Well, this portion of the capacitor is attempting to keep the sensitivity of the radio at its maximum as the oscillator is shifting because, you're, you know, they're both moving at the same time. So what they've done is they've attached the oscillator and the antenna tuning section together so that as you're tuning this, you can look at it as it's automatically continually keeping this antenna tuned to the radio so you have maximum sensitivity throughout the entire band or throughout the entire dial range of the radio. Now you'll notice that in some radio receivers they'll have you know two, three, four uh, 
uh, sections of capacitors all gang together with one shaft and they're all tuning different stages at the same time. So one might be tuning the front end, one might be tuning the RF stage, may have a second RF stage and then an oscillator stage. So they'll have capacitors with many more sections in them. And then of course they're tailored to the design itself. So when they're putting these things together, the engineer is saying, okay, well the capacitance needs to shift this much. So we're going to give it this many plates so that it moves in this many picofarad. And, you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into all of this stuff. And these here are the adjustments for it. So this will trim up this capacitor here so that you can get rid of the, you know, the variability, I guess you could call it. What's going to happen here is that you can tune this for a certain area and then it will track from that area on. And that's the reason that they have this right here. And then, of course, this is the adjustment for the oscillator. And then there's another adjustment down here for the actual oscillator coil. Where does all of that bring us? What flaw or what problem do I see on the top end? Well, immediately it's tube placement. So this glass tube right here is a rectifier tube. All right. And then what this does is this takes the, the line cord. So you have 120 on the line and that takes that and changes it to direct current for the radio. That's what this one does here. So the entire radio inside runs on DC. So it takes whatever is coming out of the wall and changes it to DC. And on the underside, there's going to be some filters. We'll take a look at this here in just a moment. And then what happens is that powers up the entire radio. So this is a very important tube in this radio, right? It's changing everything to DC. The problem lies is this here is an audio output tube. This big glass tube is an audio output tube, usually a 50L6. And what happens is, is this needs to be attached to the audio output transformer. We'll take a look at that here in just a moment. Now, whenever you have an oscillator section in a radio like this, the oscillator tube is right next to it because you don't want any excessive lead length. Well, the audio output tube is right next to the oscillator section. So that means that there's a tube placement issue. They wouldn't put the oscillator tubes over here and then run all the leads all the way over to the oscillator coil. In any oscillator section, you want to keep lead length as short as possible because you deal with stray capacitance and you know in leads and things like that. And you also get inductance in the length of the leads, which causes issues that'll cause oscillations and everything. So I can already tell you that this tube right here is in the wrong spot. Let's remove this. This should be a 50L6. This is a very standard common AA5. There it is. 50L6 right there. All right. GT is glass tube. And then G is glass. All right. Made in Canada. Don't see that very often anymore. Okay, so we know that we have a problem there. Now, the 12SA7 will be the oscillator tube that should be in here. A 12SK7 is known as an IF amplifier, and the 12SQ7 is an audio amplifier and a detector tube. Okay, so let's see what they plugged in right at the opposite end of the radio. There it is. 12SA7. This is the oscillator tube. So this is going to need to be in this socket right here. I've yet to verify this. Okay, so we know that that already is wrong. So we'll just leave this out because I don't know the placement over here. I have a really good idea. Usually after the IF transformer, right after the IF transformer is the 12SK7. And then it moves down the chain to the audio amplifier detector and then the audio output. So I imagine that's most likely the way that this is going to be. So let's take a look at the underside. And as you can see, the fellow that worked on this did a pretty nice job. Honestly. Don't really agree with the uh, capacitor choice. I stick to Rubicon, Nishicon, United Chemicon. I'll stick to those because I know that they're very good. So, um, yeah, at any rate, this is what he's put in here. And he's usually used the old little bracket to hold the old capacitor and he's just put them in there. All in all, the job that's done under here is a really nice job. Even though, you know, he's used the J hook method, right? There's a little bit of the J hooking method going on in here, which is fine. A lot of the components were soldered directly to the socket. 
lead length here is a little bit excessive. And as you can see, the lead length over here is a little bit excessive as well. But all in all, for somebody that's doing this really as a beginner, this is a very nice job. It really is. Put it this way, I've seen a lot worse. So all in all, it's looking really good on the bottom. So now, we want to know if the rectifier is in the right spot. So this is the rectifier here, okay? And as we can see, the line cord runs over here, right over to here. One way to find out if it's in the right socket is to follow the lead to the rectifier. And that would be this lead right here. Now this could have been replaced, you know, it's a little bit crusty here, and this could have been replaced from this point all the way back to the socket, but you can see this runs directly over here to the rectifier right into this, right, which is a filter capacitor. All right, so this tells us right now, you know, this is where the whole chain starts, and we have filtering going on over here. So this is gonna be correct. And see that right here, rectifiers there. So we can leave that alone. That's looking pretty good. So now, let's just remove this tube, see what's going on. I'm gently rocking this back and forth while pulling up. You don't want to be careful that you don't, you know, very, you know, give it a lot of rocking. You want to just rock it like this as you pull it up. Reason being is you don't want to break this little locking area. This is an index on the bottom here, and you see that little you see you know, kind of an extrusion on there. This is known as an octal tube base. And they, you can see the little index there. Well, they're pretty loose on this area here and that allows you to rock them and pull them out, but you don't want to excessively, you know, I guess put excessive force on them because I've seen many people break these index pins or this little index area off. This is very common in guitar amplifiers. They always seem to be broken off in those. So anyways, this is a 12SQ7, so this is the detector and first audio. So this is going to be right next to the audio output tube, and I can guarantee you that the audio tube will not be here because this is the IF transformer. So this is going to be the IF. Okay, so this should be a 12SK7. It is. Okay, so a 12SK7 here. So we're going to want to put that in this socket right here because this is right next the IF chain going here, and then it's going to run from this tube into the detector in first audio, which is most likely going to be this tube right here. We'll just verify this in a moment. I'll take a look at the bottom of the chassis. Plug that in there. And then the audio output tube should be the furthest one down the chain. So it's almost, almost like every tube except for this one here was in the wrong socket. <laughs> this is why it's so important to take note of everything that's done. So let's take a look here. So the audio output tube is going to have a large value resistor from the cathode, which should be number eight. This is pin eight right here, and this is running to ground. And then we're going to have our signal coming in on five. This is the audio output tube right here. So this is the coupling capacitor. This is the coupling capacitor right here. That's running from the plate of the 12SQ7, running over here to the grid, which is number 5, pin number 5 of the 50L6. That's this one right here, right? So we can go 8, 7, 6, 5. Okay, so that's the signal in. Cathode resistor right here. That's it. So what do you think? Let's try it out. So I am going to plug this into my current limited isolation and variac supply. Reason being is because the chassis on these radio receivers can be hot or not, depending on which way you plug it in. As you can see, there isn't an indexed or polarized plug here. So you can plug it into the wall this way, or you can plug it in this way, which gives you a 50-50 chance of making the chassis of the radio connected directly to the AC line. And that's why... The knobs are Bakelite, and there is no connection to the outside. And the antenna connection, which will most likely be isolated by some form of a capacitor underneath the chassis so that this here doesn't cause any issues. That's one of the biggest problems that cause you know, issues with antenna tuning coils and things like that is the cap on the antenna that isolates the antenna connection, you know, basically over time, because they're wax capacitors, they end up uh, 
well, coming close to a short, you connect this to an out, outdoor antenna or something like that, and maybe it's close to ground, and if this is plugged in the wrong way, bad things happen. You get big sparks, and you wreck the antenna connection. Sometimes you actually blow the connection right off over here. So whenever a radio like this is worked on, it's always advisable to use an isolation transformer. Mine is current limited, and I also have it on a Variac as well, so I can bring it up slowly, which we are going to do right now. So plug this in. There it is. Turn my Variac down. And let's see here. I'll put this on like so. I'll turn this up to about Variac up to about 50 volts. Turn this on. That's normal. You'll see the light light up just a little bit. And as the radio starts to pull current, so basically as the rectifier tube heats up and the rest of the radio starts to draw current through the rectifier, this here will get brighter. And since I'm at 50 volts on the line, that is gonna take some time. Let's see if I can get some of the light out of here so we can see this just a little bit better. So it's looking good okay and it's dr not drawing excessive current. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is turn this up to about 100 volts. I think I hear a bit of hum now. I do. Look at that. It's coming to life. It's coming to life. And it's not humming, so he did a nice job with the caps and getting everything all put together. Okay, I'll turn this down and give it full line voltage. All right, everything should get nice and warm now. So there's an oscillation happening here. This is good for Halloween. Make it uh, make it into a Halloween radio or something. Okay, that's enough of that. At any rate, so what's happening is there's an oscillation happening here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go grab a little tool and we'll just see if that oscillation is happening anywhere in the chain here, and we'll most likely be able to address that here in just a moment. So I'll just go get that I'll be right back. Let's try and find the oscillation using the Carlson Super Probe here. So this is something I put together a number of years ago. There's a video right here on YouTube about how to build one of these things if you're interested in it. And if you're interested in the printed circuit board diagrams and alignment procedure and all that kind of stuff, everything pre-sized and all that, that's all up on Patreon as well. So there's lots of attachments up there for this. At any rate, let's take a look and see if we can actually find this weird oscillation. So this is a very, very sensitive tool. Turn this on here. Turn that up. So this listens to all sorts of things. You'll see here in a moment. So I'll just connect this to the chassis here to keep it somewhat quiet. And I'll just move the probe around. You'll see this little green LED light up when we get a substantial signal coming into the probe. So you can hear this is fluttering right now. We would see this LED start to flutter with the oscillation here if we get close to it. So I'll move around here. So you hear that? This is picking up the rectification going on inside this rectifier right now. So that's changing AC to DC and we're hearing it. That's what that sounds like. Anyways, I'll move this along here. I don't see anything by the actual oscillator itself. We can see the oscillator is working. See that? That indicates that the oscillator is working. It's very strong.
And then again, this is the rectifier doing its thing. So let's move over here to the IF stage. So we can see that the oscillation is in the IF section. By me moving the probe closer and further away from this glass tube is actually affecting that oscillation. And we might even see... Yeah, we can hear a little bit of filament buzz in there. And a bunch of other things going on. If I tuned this into a station, we'd actually hear the station in here, most likely. So what does this tell us? Just shut this off and turn this down. So what does this tell us? Well, I'm about to forecast what's going on here. Every one of these radios tells a story, all right? And as you work on this kind of stuff, more often you get to realize what's going on and you get to see a chain of events. What's happened is the tubes have been put into the wrong spots. What's the next thing that happens? Well, nothing happens, right? Because all the tubes are in the wrong spot. Chances are, now I don't know this yet because we haven't, you know, stuck screwdrivers in any slots here and tried to tune any of the IF transformers or anything like that. But usually what happens is, is, since nothing comes out of the radio at this point, the next best thing to do is start turning everything in sight. So you screwdriver the radio right out of alignment and you put it into oscillation. And I can almost, almost guarantee that. So tubes put into the wrong spot, turn the radio on, nothing happens. So... Next thing you want to do is try and tune everything to see if you can get a radio signal. So I can almost guarantee that these IF transformers are right out of tune. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go grab a tuning tool and I'll be right back. We'll uh, work on this thing and see if we can just peek this up by ear and see if we can get this thing performing somewhat normal without going through an, a complete routine alignment right now. Okay, let's address this and see if we can peak this thing up and get rid of that oscillation. So we'll start with this one right here, using an insulated tuning tool. Wow, listen to how that's coming up, eh? Was here. Right about there. It's even receiving a station just like that. I just want to peak for maximum static right now. Okay, we'll go over to this one. All right, then I'll go back over to this one here. Okay, so we want to go to the upper end of the dial and give this a bit of a tune. We'll see what happens here. This is the antenna tuning section. So turn that down. And how we can tell that we're going to the upper end of the dial without actually looking at the dial face? How can we do that? You might want to take a guess on that right now. Well, when the capacitor is fully meshed, so all the plates are inside of each other, it's at the lowest frequency. When the plates are completely out of each other, it's at the highest frequency. So again, this is just a, a quick preliminary tuning. As you can see, I'm moving this open. 
Okay, so this would be the upper end of the dial right here. If the plates were to go this way and be fully meshed, that's going down in frequency. And as they open, it goes up in frequency. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to peek the antenna section here and see if we can get any more sensitivity out of that. So turn the volume up so we can hear it. Okay. Look at that. Everything's been turned in this. Okay, so watch. Now this one here and this one here will adjust the dial tracking to make this track correctly. And these here are adjustment points. So you adjust this and these are these correspond to frequencies on the dial, so you don't have to have the dial glass there. We won't worry about that right now. All we're going to do is just see if we can get this thing working. And at that, maybe we'll dedicate an actual full alignment video to this thing. If you're interested in that, you can leave that down below. How about that? Okay, let's see how far and, uh, you know, how well this gets us into the received portion of this radio. See if it's working well. It's doing extremely well for being in the lab here because the lab is, there's basically no reception in here whatsoever. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get an external antenna attached to the back here and then we'll sweep through the band and see how well it does with an actual external antenna. Again, the, the lab is, um, I guess you could say very well shielded. I'll be back. All right, let's attach this to an external antenna and see how well this thing receives. So this is still attached to my current limited isolation transformer and variac supply, so I feel quite safe about attaching this common. Attach that to the tuning capacitor there. And I'll attach the antenna signal lead right over here. Here's hear radio stations already. There are radio stations everywhere. This thing is really trying to receive. Now, normally there's a religious station right at the bottom of the dial. So in order to get a quick idea, if the oscillator is somewhat in alignment, I should be able to hear a religious station right now. And what does that tell you? Well, just like everything else in this thing with screwdriver, I imagine the oscillator is screwdriver as well, right? And there's no religious station down there whatsoever. It's it's out of alignment here. So it's really trying to receive. And it seems to be working just fine. So if you're interested in actually seeing a full alignment of this radio receiver, so align the IF, the antenna section, and the oscillator section using some test equipment, let me know in the comments below and we'll address it at that point. We'll go through and give this thing the... Uh, the supreme tune-up and then see how well this thing actually performs. So all in all, really, the only thing that's wrong with this thing was the tubes are in the wrong socket and it was basically screwdrivered into outer space. So the fellow that worked on this before did a great job on the under half. He got everything right because it is working. Just something as simple as the tubes are put into the wrong socket. And then of course after that, Nothing was received, so everything got twisted and made everything all that much worse. If you're enjoying my videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up 
and hang around. There'll be many more videos like this coming in the near future. We'll be taking a look at vacuum tube and solid state electronic devices alike. So a lot of very interesting things coming in the near future. If you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that as well. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way and gaining access to many of my personal electronic inventions and designs, you're definitely going to want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'll put the link just below the video's description and I'll also pin the link at the top of the comment section. So if you click on the link, it'll take you right there. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.